how testosterone replacement therapy has dramatic benefits, uh, just as severe consequences as female menopause, and the problem is decreased testosterone. We have cardiovascular aging, brain aging, and more subtle things like loss of drive and competitive edge, general inflammatory state. Remember, testosterone, higher CRP, inflammatory cytokines, stiffness in muscles and joints, and, well, you might have heard this, but if the only thing stiff in the morning is your back, that's a sign of testosterone deficiency. There's falling levels of fitness. You can be throwing around heavy weights, but if you don't have the testosterone, you can't incorporate the protein into the muscle. Workouts just won't work as well. Uh, can lose bone. Osteoporosis is a male disease as well. Anemia, part of testosterone deficiency. Lower testosterone, higher rates of all cancers. Just being grouchy and, you know, irritable and tired, and dysphoric, part of androgen deficiency. And it's not all about sex, but of course there's the sex part. There's the uh, reduced libido and potency and decreased morning erections and decreased uh, erectile tension, longer refractory period between orgasms, and decreased intensity of orgasms, a symptom that's mentioned all the time. We talked about how andropause is a deficiency disease, where restoring youthful levels in men that have a testosterone deficiency. It can start early. Every man's on his own curve. It can start at 30. If you go between 25 and 75, there's about a 30% decrease in total testosterone. But bioavailable, that the cells can use, there's a 50% decrease. And we'll, we'll go through total and free and bioavailable. Now, every individual's falling off the testosterone curve, but the whole world is as well. This is scary stuff. Testosterone is getting lower worldwide. Look at this. In the 80s, average testosterone for, say, a 60-year-old, I'll make it, I'm 64, I'll make it 64-year-old, was like uh, 550. That was the 80s. Then in the 90s, hmm, it's like 450. Then in the 2000s, oh my gosh, it's 420 or 30. What is like one of these disaster movies? Looks like it's going to zero. Boom. And why is this? It's got to be something environmental. You know, take your, pick your theory. And andropause is a lethal disease, so we want to treat it. Now, this is the study I showed you before, the core study from circulation. Higher testosterone, live longer. Twice the chance of dying with a low testosterone of all cause. And this has been repeated in many studies, looking at it in a different way. The Shores study looked at um, VA patients. The low testosterone group had an 88% increased mortality. Then let's get rid of a reference ranges. And a classic comment is, because before we treated testosterone, well, the, the, the advice was, well, you want to normalize for age. But if you were giving someone glasses, would you normalize their vision for age? Would you give an 80-year-old average vision for 80? Or blood pressure? Do you want to normalize that for age? No, we want optimal. On the disk you'll have, there's another series of slides, which is again part of your journal club, which are other articles that I'm not going to speak about individually, but about 15 articles of testosterone and cardiovascular system, sex function, Alzheimer's. So on the disk that you have, you'll have a current library of everything important. Total testosterone, that counts the testosterone that's floating around free in the serum. The testosterone that's tightly bound to sex hormone binding globulin, can't use it, and the testosterone that's loosely bound to albumin. So total's okay, but you see the limitations. Free testosterone is just the part floating free. Limitations are it doesn't count the loosely bound to albumin that you can use. Bioavailable perhaps is the state of the art now because you have the free plus the uh, loosely bound. Ranges, again, total labs vary, but we want to know how you're going to pick what range you want. You want the youthful range. You want the upper quarter of the reference range, typically. So totals go between 3 and 100 nanograms per deciliter. Other countries, except out of the United States, use nanomoles, and there's the conversion factors that you have. For, so you have to look at what units are being used. Sometimes the decimal point moves around, again, according to what units. Now, sex hormone binding globulin binds testosterone tighter than estrogens. And here's average ranges in males and females. 
So when you intervene with a hormone, you're going to change sex hormone binding globulin. So what's that going to do to everything else? Remember, this is a symphony of hormones. What increases SHBG? Thyroid, estrogens, progesterone, aging itself, and low insulin. Remember, low insulin is a good thing, but increased SHBG may or may not be a good thing. So let's see how does this work. You have a menopausal woman, even though we're talking about testosterone in men now. You start her on estrogen and progesterone replacement, no testosterone. What's that going to do to her SHBG? Up. What's that going to do to her free testosterone? Down. What's that going to do to her libido, typically? Down. So you have to know what you're doing. What decreases sex hormone binding globulin? Testosterone. So you might get a feed-forward cycle. Maybe you can use a little less afterwards. You probably won't want it, though. Uh, glucocorticoids. Hopefully we're not using too much of that. Growth hormone and high insulin. So free testosterone, again, depends where the decimal point goes, is in the 8 to 30 nanogram range. We want the higher end. The op and uh, lab, you know, labs aren't that accurate in doing free testosterone. So again, you have to look, look at it all together. Does it make sense? Bioavailable, again, the upper end of the range is 600. That's probably the most useful number. Now, there's a free, free testosterone calculator. I said the word free twice because it doesn't cost anything, and it gets you the free. And you can download it from that website. We'll see if it works here. You know, computers are like kids. You know, they never show off on cue. But we'll see if this actually works. Okay, now. So now we know if the HIPAA police isn't looking, we'll try to get somebody's actual testosterone numbers. Now, first, it's got albumin in it. Now, we don't think about albumin too much. First, if you have a metabolic panel on the patient, as you probably do, as your, your basic workup, you have, their, you have his albumin. And is it good to have higher albumin? There's some, there's some immune system benefits, right? If you wash your hands more, supposedly your albumin's higher. So it plays in, though. We'll see how it fits together. So does anybody happen to know and want to share, we can make up numbers, of course, your testosterone and your sex hormone binding globulin, or just your testosterone. Anybody out here in the front row, what's your total testosterone? What you got? We'll do men here. <laughs> Anyone want to tell me? Uh, what's, any, any numbers available? You got to plug some in. 170? Just a guy or a girl? It's a guy. It's a patient. Okay, 170. That would be pretty low. You'd be barely alive. But I mean, <laughs> you see it. Okay, let's let's see how this works. So let's take let's take say testo total testosterone of 300. That's you know that's lower than that. That's the endocrinology definition of hypogonadism. And say a sex hormone binding globulin, say 40. And then we press calculate and see if it works. It does. Bioavailable 120. Remember, the top's about 60. But now we can see, let's say his albumin's higher because he washes his hands more or whatever, better liver function. What's that going to do to the bioavailable? Up or down? What's your vote? Let's see. So let's say we'll go from an albumin of 4.3 to 5. Okay, remember, we'll watch the bioavailable. It went from 123 to... 133. More. Makes sense, because the more albumin that's there, the testosterone can come off it. 